We'll be looking at John chapter 18, verses 1 through 14, as we're just making our way through the gospel according to John <clears throat> on Sunday mornings, chapter by chapter and verse by verse, so that we won't miss anything the Lord has desired for us to look at and understand. We remember back in this upper room discourse, chapters 13 through 17, we've heard Jesus speak important information to his disciples after the Last Supper, during the Passover feast where the Jewish people commemorated the night Almighty God delivered Egypt or delivered Israel out of bondage to Egypt when the people of God would kill a yearling lamb and put its blood on the doorposts of their dwellings so that the angel of death would pass over their homes. But those in Egypt who did not put the blood on the doorposts were exposed to this death which killed all firstborn males in Egypt. As Almighty God had warned the king of Egypt that if he did not let God's people leave Egypt, that God would take their firstborn male children in death. And this was the sign from God that finally set people free from Egypt, the sign of death. The sign of death. The sign of death is in the world today, isn't it? Death is coming unless we have the blood of the Lamb on the doorposts of our hearts. The sign of death is what sets people free because it sends them to the one who can make them free. Free from sin and death. The power of the gospel. The Son of God, Jesus, would come 1,500 years later and willingly give his life on the cross so that death would no longer have the power in God's creation. This is the story of Jesus, the Son of God who died to take away the power of sin and death in this world. And before we might think that this is some kind of religious myth from antiquity, we must remember it was all pictured there in Egypt with Moses, which was recorded for God's people to know and understand. All pictured for us that God would save his people from death through the blood of the Lamb. And when we consider the ancient Jewish prophecies recorded hundreds of years before Christ in these historical writings that we can verify and look at today, it leaves no doubt this is a work of God pointing to the freedom that we can have from sin and death. Death that had entered God's creation through man's sin to God, and yet God in his mercy making a way for all to be saved and having eternal life. So as Jesus gives his disciples this final instruction, the night before he goes to the cross, Jesus promises them that the Holy Spirit would come and indwell them and lead them into all truth. He would teach them <clears throat> all things. Jesus would promise his peace to his disciples and that Jesus would give them his joy in this fallen world as the disciples went into all the world to testify of this risen Savior, which leads us to chapter 18, verse 1. Now when Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. The Apostle John, writing this decades later, doesn't include some of the information we see from the other Gospels of Matthew, Mark, 
and Luke. It seems that John is trying to point out and share information that isn't in the other accounts to give a different perspective, a clear understanding from his point of view and how the Holy Spirit would bring to his remembrance all of these things when John was writing this gospel when he was 90 years old. John was just a teenager when he met Jesus. But Jesus impacted his life in such a way that Jesus was just as alive to John when John was 90 as when he was when he was 17. That's the real Jesus. That's the kind of Jesus we want to follow in life and have that same impact in our lives. Not a religious Jesus, but the real Jesus who died on a cross and rose from the dead. So after Jesus gives this final instruction to the disciples, they go out of Jerusalem and cross over the brook Kidron that's in a ravine just north east of the city and begin to walk up the Mount of Olives on this slope. And in the Mount of Olives there were these olive groves and there were gardens where people of the city would build because it was illegal to use fertilizer within the city limits because <clears throat> of the strict religious rules. So they would build these beautiful gardens, have these, these wonderful olive groves. And as you visit Israel today, some of those trees are dated at over 2,000 years old. You can actually see and touch some of the trees on the Mount of Olive, Olives that would have been there at the time of Christ. As they enter, it says this garden, which implies it was a gated garden, it was called the Garden of Gethsemane, which someone allowed Jesus to use, as we are told, Jesus went there often with his disciples. It would have been a private garden, but someone had said, Jesus, it's yours. I want this place to be your place, and it's a place where I can meet with you. It's a place where the disciples can meet with you. The word Gethsemane means olive press. There would have been an olive press in the garden. They were very numerous. They would gather the olives, press out the oil, because the olive oil was very essential to that ancient life. What strikes me is that someone cared enough about Jesus and, and thought so much of him that they would open their garden to him and say, it's yours. And of course, they would meet there with Jesus as well. We can have that symbolically in our life today. This part of my life is yours. I want to meet with you in that garden. And of course, we remember the, the classic hymn, I come to the garden alone. Coming to the garden to be with Jesus. And we can have that place in a spiritual sense in our life today. But like any garden, it must be cultivated. <clears throat> it must be nurtured. It must be taken care of and kept up. And that's where we want that place to be with Jesus. And this garden, the other Gospels tell us Jesus prayed that night while the disciples slept. And in that prayer, he asked the Father that if there was any other way that this cup would pass away from him. As Jesus spoke of the cup of the wrath of God. The wrath of God for sin. Although God is merciful and kind and gentle, he's also righteous and just. And he's also the judge of all the world, all the universe, and must judge rightly. And he does that when, when we deliberately, knowingly sin against God, the cup of God's wrath is upon us, until we come to Christ where our sin is atoned for through the work of Jesus as he takes that sin upon himself. So Jesus intentionally <clears throat> went to this place because he knew Judas knew that's where Jesus would go. And as Judas chose to betray Jesus to the chief Jewish priests, that had condemned Jesus to die even before Jesus had been tried. 
all because Jesus was a threat to their way of life as they had given into corruption. They had given into greed and, and power. They had given into religious hypocrisy, all in the name of God. And Jesus confronted them throughout the Gospels, and that's why they wanted him dead. And for someone that doesn't understand the concept of sin and salvation and the work of God and redeeming mankind from eternal separation because of sin, this would seem to be some sort of tragedy in time. That this poor Jesus was killed by these greedy men that didn't understand who Jesus was or they didn't understand what Jesus wanted to do. That's the way the world sees Jesus. But nothing could be further from the truth. Jesus knew exactly what he was doing and was following the will of the Father to present himself as the Lamb of God. As a sacrifice for the sin of the world, his blood shed, applied to us by faith, defeating sin and death in our life, allowing Jesus to become our Passover. Then Judas, in verse 3, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, <clears throat> came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. Then, when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. <clears throat> then he asked them again, Whom are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these speaking of his disciples, go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled which Jesus spoke of those whom you gave me I have lost none. So as Judas agreed to show the Jewish rulers where Jesus could be arrested outside of the city without inciting a riot during the Passover and now the, the unleavened bread feast. They asked for a detachment of troops, which would mean Roman soldiers, because we also are told they received officers from the chief Jewish priests. These would be temple guards. They would come with the, the members of the Jewish Sanhedrin or the, the council <clears throat> with a group of the Pharisees the religious rulers. And it appears that there would have been between 200 to 1,000 Roman soldiers in these types of detachments from early Roman records. Along with the officers or Jewish temple guards, which would be many as well. Along with the chief priests, members of the council. We're talking about hundreds of armed men with weapons and lanterns and torches marching out of the city down the ravine and up the Mount of Olives to arrest Jesus with Judas leading the way. And as they approach the place where Jesus is, Jesus goes forward to meet them, to present himself. The other Gospels tell us the disciples were sleeping and in fact Jesus had to wake them as the soldiers approached and Jesus went forward. No doubt surprising the troops as they probably supposed Jesus and the disciples would run and hide and that's why they brought the torches and the lanterns and the weapons to search for the hiding Jesus. But no. He came out to them to present himself as the Lamb of God. And John points out that Jesus knew all things 
that would take place in the t context of what would happen that night. This shows us that Jesus is in complete control of what will happen here. Being fully human and yet fully God, having this knowledge revealed by the Father and pointing to his choice in his humanity to submit his life to the will of the Father in redeeming mankind, which just makes us love Jesus all the more. He knew all things that would come upon him. The other Gospels tell us in the garden while he's praying that he's filled with great anguish and, and anxiety, even experiencing sweating great drops of blood. And in that garden, kneeling down, he says, Father, not my will, but thy will be done. And in my opinion, I don't think he was filled with the anxiety from the physical <clears throat> torture that he would endure in the physical pain on the cross. The book of Romans tells us, he who knew no sin became sin for us. This is Almighty God the Son who never knew sin. He could see what sin would do, but he never knew sin in his soul. This always touches me so deeply that he knew my sin. And he took my sin and your sin on the cross. And that's what brought this great anguish. The writer of the book of Hebrews makes this commentary as he yields to the will of the Father. Jesus knew no sin. He didn't understand what sin felt like. But he also understood on that cross he would take our sin and the sin of the world upon his sinless soul. And that's what caused the anguish that he felt in the garden. And he cried out, Father, not my will, but thy will be done. In his humanity, not knowing what that would be like, yielding and trusting in the will of his Father through that kind of anguish. I think every disciple of Jesus must face that kind of place in a sense. Faced with our way in situations in, con in contrast to what we know God wants. It is a place of deep anguish that Christians must experience in order to know the will of God. The New Testament teaches us these things. The book of Romans tells us that as we're transformed, we know the will of God for our lives, going through difficult places where Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. A place of pain, a place of anguish and sorrow to yield our lives to what we know God is desiring. This is the closest we will ever be like Jesus this side of heaven when we yield our lives in a place of suffering to what we know God wants. And Christians, I want you to know that this is true Christianity. We have a tendency to run from pain and suffering in difficult places because we have free will. We live in a country where we can just about do what we want. Man, I'm not putting up with that. But what does the Father say? What does he tell us in his word? What garden do you have in your life? Where do you come from? Who is your God? All of these things we must face in our walk with Jesus as we bow our life to the will of the Father in a difficult place, in a place of anguish, which ultimately brings glory to God in our lives. This is amazing to me. The opportunity God gives us to be like Jesus. And if we have failed in that place, which we all have, we failed to yield to the will of God. You must know that there's always going to be another opportunity 
because that's what life presents to us. One difficult place after another where we can find victory and glorify God. We're going to see this in the life of Peter who completely missed the point and failed to try to stand in his own strength for Jesus. And he would learn what we have known that the mercies of God are new every morning. And as Jesus asked them, whom are you seeking? Jesus knew who they were looking for, right? Why did Jesus ask them? Was Jesus trying to make a statement? Every time Jesus asks a question, he's always trying to make a statement. He's trying to bring out a truth to whoever he's speaking to, and he often asks us these questions that come from the Scripture. Whom are you really seeking in your life? What is it that you want? And he wants us to be able to answer that question. Whom are you seeking? It appears Jesus was trying to make a statement as the guards replied, Jesus of Nazareth. As Jesus said, I am he. And notice the word he is on italics in your Bibles. So this word he was added by the translators for clarity, but not in the original language. But Jesus here actually just says, I am. And we are told Judas stood with them. But when Jesus said, I am, the soldiers and the guards, and I presume Judas as well, drew back and fell to the ground. And when Jesus declared, I am, it appears that divine power just exuded from Jesus or came into that place causing the soldiers to draw back and fall to the ground. We remember from Exodus chapter 3 when Moses asked God, who shall I say sent me? God told Moses, you tell them I am has sent you. The name of God, the I am, the powerful name of God, the great I am. And that's what Jesus told this group of, of soldiers and people that came out with hatred. I want to tell you who I am. And they fell backwards to the ground. Picture this. They've got weapons and torches and lanterns. They're all falling down. This chaos taking place. And and, you know, with the torches and lantern, I'm wondering if stuff was catching on fire, if they were, you know, all the swords clanging. Jesus just stands there and waits for them to compose them. So he could have, as soon as they fell down, said, guys, let's go, and took off running. But he stands there and waits for them to compose themselves and then asks again, whom are you seeking they probably answer somewhat sheepishly, Jesus of Nazareth? And again, Jesus answers, I have told you that I am. Therefore, if you seek me, then let these go their way. Changing the whole dynamic and the tenor of the situation, don't you think? Who's in control now? Who's being arrested now? And as they fall backwards in this place. Jesus takes control. It's almost saying to me, if you don't want to be on the ground, then let these go their way. Acknowledge who I am. As Jesus is ever protecting his disciples and taking control of this volatile situation, as the Apostle John adds his commentary in verse 9, that the saying might be fulfilled of which he spoke of those whom you gave me have lost none except for the son of perdition, which is Judas. And Jesus prayed earlier. Remember in chapter 17, Father, I have lost none that you have given me except the son of perdition. John would remember this 
that Jesus was thinking about them. He was taking care of them. It shows us the heart of Jesus for his disciples. He's about to be arrested, tortured, and crucified, and he knows what it means to be crucified. He knows what it means to be examined by, the, by Rome, the scourge. He understands the thing he doesn't know is what it feels like to take on sin. And yet, he's more concerned about these sinful disciples and these people arresting him in his own life, taking care of his disciples. They no doubt would have been arrested along with Jesus that night and crucified as well. I want you to know that Jesus has the same kind of care and concern for his disciples today, even facing imminent death. The Spirit of God filling us with the power of God to look death in the face and say, Whom are you seeking? Whoever you're looking for is not here. He has been risen. And it's Christ in me. Death, you have nothing on me. Just as Jesus would pray. This risen Savior in us, us now in the power of the name of Jesus and the the chaotic, messed up, difficult places we get ourselves into in life are there to show us the need for the real Jesus, not the religious Jesus, but the real Jesus that is an ever-present help in time of trouble. Psalm 46. Ever-present, ever-living, absolutely capable to help us in our time of trouble. Of trouble in our time in that garden and in that place when we want to run so bad and yet Jesus protects us so Jesus gets the situation under control and verse 10 then Simon Peter having a sword and you can just write in there uh-oh <laughs> Simon Peter having a sword drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Then Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? Peter, reacting in the flesh, and I believe with great courage and boldness. Remember, he had told Jesus earlier, but I would die for you. And those were just vain words. Peter was, was a true man. He, he was, the, you know, the, the extra biblical writings tell us he was a big, burly fisherman-like guy, and you just didn't mess with Peter. So there's, there's almost a thousand troops in, in, at the at entrance of this garden. Peter pushes Jesus aside, pulls out his sword, probably half asleep, and starts swinging away. you got to like Peter. I would like to think that I would die for Jesus. But the real question is, can I live for him? Jesus tells Peter to put the weapon away. Great courage, great boldness, but in complete ignorance of what was taking place spiritually. Did not have a clue. Taking the sword which from the word was probably more like a machete or long dagger lashes out in rage striking the servant of the high priest and it's interesting we are given his name as there aren't any other gospels that tell us the name of the servant his name was Malchus servant of the high priest did John tell us this decades later because Malchus had become a disciple of Jesus it's possible. But Jesus tells Peter, put the weapon away. The other Gospels tell us that as Jesus, no doubt, gets between Peter and these, this large group, he says, Peter, don't you know that I could call 12 legions of angels? Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? 
Man, I want to have that kind of confidence in my life. As I go through a difficult place and being arrested by whatever this life has to throw at me, I can say, I know I'm in the will of God and He won't leave me or forsake me. And I don't have to pull out a sword. I don't have to pull out a lawsuit or whatever else it may be. I can say, Jesus has got it. That's the kind of Christian life I think we all would like to live. But it takes knowledge and understanding that Peter was lacking at this point. As this brings up this, this kind of situation we can find ourselves in life at times as Christians, that at times we can use a weapon in our fervor in following Jesus, but like Peter, miss the point. And the lesson is, whenever we want to lash out or strike out with some kind of weapon that can hurt, like our words or our actions, we must first ask Jesus what he thinks. And I believe Jesus, by the Holy Spirit, will reveal his heart to us and certainly has shown us much about those things in his word. Love your enemies. Pray for those who spitefully mistreat you. Pray for those. Don't curse them. Pray for them. Revealing Jesus' heart to us. And I would assume, like me, most of us have chopped off an ear or two in our time of being with Jesus when we really needed to slow down and listen to what Jesus was saying and be led by Jesus instead of our flesh or our human emotions. Don't you think? I know that applies to me. Maybe it applies to you as well. And if it does, you can say, Oh Lord, let me write this one down. I'm not pulling swords anymore. I'm going to yield my life to you. And the cup Jesus spoke of was the will of God. That the son would be arrested, tried and condemned to death on the cross for the sin of the world, for my sin and your sin. That's the big picture. The big picture of God, what God is wanting to do, which generally is, is clearly shown to us in the Word of God, this big picture of what God is doing in this world. And it's not hidden, but it's available for all who will take the time to seek it. As all this was foretold in the prophecies that the disciples would have had access to. But there's so much in this world that can take our focus off of what God is doing especially in our personal lives. I'm excited to, to get into what God was doing in Peter's life because many of us are much like him. In our personal lives, God is wanting to do something in our personal lives, which may include a dark garden, some swinging swords, and the Word of God. All of those things will be involved. The turmoil, the chaos, the feelings of betrayal, the hurt. It's all part of the work of God. Hasn't God said, and I will work all of these things together for good to those that love me? In our personal lives, God is working. God didn't pay this kind of price to save us, just to leave us the way we are. He wants to change our lives. He wants to transform us to be like Jesus. And we must never lose sight of what God is desiring to do in us personally through the dark places we end up in life, lest we miss much of it like Peter that night. The other Gospels tell us, Peter lashed out, striding the man's ear, cutting it off, and Jesus takes the ear, puts it back on the man's head, 
as no doubt when Peter struck the servant's ear, these swords come flying out of their sheaves. This whole thing is ready to blow up. And Jesus, again, in complete control, diffuses the crowd, the chaos, with an act of mercy and kindness. Remember that lesson for sure. When things are building to a boiling point and it's about ready to blow up, we can be like Jesus and offer an act of mercy and kindness and healing. And if we don't know how, we can just ask him because he's really good at it. We have the Holy Spirit in us that will teach us these things. It's then the other Gospels tell us that the disciples of Jesus flee as Jesus puts out his hands ready to be bound with the rope and led away. But poetically speaking, we know it wasn't the rope that bound Jesus. It was his love for us. His love for the Father who desired all humans to come to the truth and be set free from the power of sin and death. Then the detachment of troops in verse 12. And the captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus. And they bound him. But I want to guarantee you one thing. Jesus had already arrested them. And they led Jesus away to Annas first. For he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. Now it was Caiaphas who advised the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. This is interesting. History tells us Annas was the true high priest. The Old Testament law tells us that the high priest would have to come from the line <coughs> of Aaron and he would serve as high priest until he died. Well, what's going on here? And we see how Rome had <coughs> corrupted and controlled the priesthood at the time of Jesus. Historians from that time tell us the Romans removed Annas because of some rift. And I think I have some ideas of what it was. And they appointed one of the sons of Annas to do business with. Kind of a mediator between the Jews and Rome to keep the Jews under control. Very feisty group of people, you know. Lots of chutzpah. But eventually Caiaphas, the son-in-law of Annas, was now seen as the high priest by the Rome, Romans, but not the Jews. And this was all to appease the Roman government and to try to keep peace with the Jews because that's what religion will lead people to, making compromises that are absolutely not in line with God's word. Do you know how fortunate we are to have God's word protected through millennia of time so that we understand what God has said. If our government comes and tells us you need to do something that's not in this book, what do we say to the government? Is it more expedient to follow you than God? You be the judge. We see this in the book of Acts. It'll probably come to that. And it has in many places where in our modern society, folks are being pressured into doing things in their business that goes against their biblical beliefs. And they say no, and they're fined, and they're taken to court, and they say, you judge. We're going to do what God has said. And I, I love that kind of standpoint, but man, it's costing these people everything. What a great privilege, don't you think? To be able to be in a place in life where I've just got to lay everything down so that God can have his way in my life. Is that just something that happens in the headlines or does it happen in our personal lives every day? It should be happening in our lives every day. Jesus said, if you want to be my disciples, 
Take up your cross. Follow me. It should happen in our lives every single day because if it's not happening in the small areas of your life, don't kid yourself. It won't happen in the big areas either. The old saying is, it would be a lot easier to die for Jesus than to live for him. And I think it's true. We know from studying the Gospels, the priesthood at the time of Jesus was incredibly corrupted. As they sold pre-inspected animals for sacrifice at exorbitant prices and wouldn't accept Roman or Grecian coinage, they exchanged the pagan coins for Jewish shekels, also at an exorbitant exchange rate. And just earlier, Jesus had driven them all out of the temple area for this. But it was Annas who profited from the ripoff of these people that would come to, to Jerusalem, especially for the Passover, to worship God. History tells us some of these poor families would only make one trip to Jerusalem their whole life that lived two to three hundred miles away. It would be a life-changing event, just like when we got to go to Israel in 2009. It was a lifetime event. It was just riveting, incredible. And if you get the opportunity to go, then I would go and let me know if you do desire because there's groups of Calvary Chapel people going and we joined another group. You can join another group and just an awesome time. These people would, would look forward to that one time they could come to Jerusalem during the Passover and bring their sacrificial lamb and, and actually live out the word of God and then they got ripped off by these ungodly men who said they worked for God. It made Jesus angry. And it still does today. And sadly, these kinds of things still go on in Christianity. People being ripped off in the name of God. <clears throat> it's so sad. It's so tragic. If they only knew Jesus in spirit and in truth, and they can, if they will just confess their sinfulness in truth and be real with God, God will be real with them and reveal Jesus to their hearts. And that's the key for us as believers and followers of Jesus. As we go into this world, you're going to see the corruption of this world. Do we take a stand for it? What does God's word say? It says, I want you to be a light in the darkness. I want you to speak the truth in love. And it's going to come as an opportunity and just a conversation to make a stand for Jesus. Maybe, maybe putting something on the line, like maybe your career or a sale or something else. I'm going to take the opportunity to tell these people the truth because I might not see them tomorrow. And that might have been the only truth they've ever heard in their whole life because they come from a religious world that's been corrupted by Rome, in a sense. This fallen world. We need to speak the truth in love about the real Jesus, because that's how we came to Jesus, right? Didn't we come to Jesus and say, I'm sinful, I'm corrupted, I'm full of hurt, my life is a mess. Your word says that you will come into our lives and make us whole. That you will set us free. That's what I want for my life. I want to believe in Jesus and then whoo, the Holy Spirit fills our heart. And all of a sudden we know it's going to be okay. Even though life still has a lot of gardens in it, we know it's going to be okay. Because now we know the real Jesus. As we close the service this morning, I want to ask the music ministers to come and consider some of these issues this morning. Considering what Jesus means to us. That in this place today, maybe Jesus was saying to you, whom are you seeking? Are you seeking a religious Jesus? 
Are you seeking just to add a little Christianity to your life because that's probably what you should do? Do you want just a little Jesus in your life? Or do you want to know Jesus Christ and Him crucified and be in fellowship with His sufferings? Knowing the depth and the riches of who Jesus is. It's been offered to us through the work of the cross. It's been offered to us in spirit and in truth to receive the mercy of God in Christ, to believe that God so loved us that he would give us the one and only Son of God. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all human measure that he would give his only Son to make us his treasure. Whom are you seeking? What is it that you really want? It's an important question that Jesus asks us today. And it's a question that we'll be responsible for because the Spirit of God is here today confronting all of us with who we are and what we want. In the face of the love of God through the cross, let us stand together. There must be more than this. The breath of God, come breathe within. There must be more than this. Spirit of God, we wait for you. Hear us, Jesus. Spirit of God, you fall in this place. Lord, have your way. Lord, have your way in us. Hear us, Lord. Hear us, Jesus. Spirit of God. Hear us, Jesus, hear us, Lord. Hear us, Lord. Stir it up in our hearts, Lord. A passion for your name, oh God. Do that in us, we pray, oh Lord. We're so corrupted. We need you so much, Lord. Move in power and might. Move in our hearts. Thank you, Jesus. Touch your people. Be a consuming fire, my Lord. Fan it into flames. Passion. Passion for your name, Lord. Spirit of God. Have your way, Lord. Hear our hearts, Lord, this morning. If there's anyone here that has never recognized their deep need for the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, far aside from any kind of religious thought or idea, that we would say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. I indeed am corrupted like the religious rulers. I've been corrupted since childhood. God, I need your spirit working mightily in me. Help me to know and understand what you've done 
through the cross and now live in this newness of life. Not in that old way that brought such sorrow and anguish, but in this new way that brings joy in peace, even in the midst of suffering. Because now we're laying it down for you. Now we have found the heart of Jesus. Now we can pray like Jesus did, Father, not my will, but thy will be done. And glorifying the Father through the Son in our lives, in this short life that we live. God, show us the opportunities that are coming. Maybe the opportunities that are here today. And we would always remember, they begin in the small things. Because if you're not faithful in the small things, you won't be faithful in the big things either. Do that work in us, we pray. We trust you. We bless you for it, God. Because it's a promise from God. We want to be those people that know you and walk with you in spirit and in truth. And if you agree with that prayer, you can say, Amen. And give him praise this morning. Praise you, Lord. We praise you, Jesus. Amen.